thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring a section of this video. This is Dan Lunt, a professor in paleoclimate at the University of Bristol, though he sometimes goes by Samuel Tarly and even Radagast the Brown when writing scientific papers. I'm passionate about climate science and I'm also very concerned about what the future might hold in terms of changes in our climate. But very often the, the sorts of opportunities that we get to talk about climate science are to people and with people who are already concerned themselves and they, and they already have an interest in, in climate science. So as well as his serious academic work on the Earth's past climate, Dan has turned his attention to modelling the atmospheres of fantasy worlds such as Westeros and Middle Earth. I saw it as a way of, of being able to discuss climate change, to discuss climate models and their strengths and weaknesses, the, the tools that we use to make predictions about the future that inform policymaker decisions, to discuss those in a context that was in, that was interesting and might grab people's attention and also to have some fun you know I got I love reading the books and as a result it just seemed like a you know a natural thing to do to discuss to bring together these two interests of fantasy fiction and and climate change into one place in the books and TV and film adaptations of these fantasy works, we get some detail about the varying regional climates. Dawn in A Song of Ice and Fire, for example, is described as being very hot and arid, while far to the north the wall is freezing and battered by winds. And then of course there's the matter of the variable length seasons, with some winters lasting years and others lasting months. Dan wanted to see how scientifically accurate these climates are, given all the information that we have about the fantasy worlds, filling in a couple of gaps. So, we, so the way that we, we set up and framed this piece of work is that we presented it through the eyes of Samuel Tarly, who's one of the well-known characters in Game of Thrones, and we imagine that he arrived in, in Old Town where he's learning to be what we call a meister, and he became interested in climate, and we, we, and we basically told this story of the way in which he found a climate model and he learned how to use it and decided to investigate the climate of the world of Game of Thrones. If you want to read the results of Maester Tarly's work, then you can. Dan published a paper, also available in Dothraki and High Valyrian, detailing how this experiment was performed. Link in the description. But you may well ask, how could Dan possibly calculate what the climate of the world of Game of Thrones... Planetos? How could Dan, well, Samwell, possibly calculate how this climate would work? Where would they even start? So he had some maps that he found in, in the library and so he, the first thing he did was to put those, that geography of the planet, so where the continents are, where the oceans are, where the mountains are and the rivers, and he put all those in the model along with telling the model how big the earth it was and the uh, length of the day was, how hot the sun was, and those are, in fact, it turns out that those are the only things that you need to know in a climate model in order to be able to simulate the climate, because everything else just emerges from the physics and the fluid dynamics that is within that model. And that physics and fluid dynamics is the same whether you're on planet Earth or if you're on Venus or Mars or Jupiter or Westeros. Climate models then take these fundamental laws of physics and apply boundary conditions to them, such as the geography of the world. On Earth it looks like this, on Planetos it looks like this. There wasn't any info on the southern continent, so this is an educated guess. Crucially, nothing is prescribed, there's no tweaking. Dan didn't tell the model anything about what he expected to find. The only information that got fed into the model was the real basics, like the length of the day, the geography, and the intensity of the sun, and then physics does the rest, as calculated by the fundamental equations, once every time step in the computer code, and then iterated forwards. And from that emerged all the weather, and climate that was predicted by this model in the same way that um, when we have a weather forecast on, on our planet it's done through in a very similar way in that the, a climate model is set up for our particular planet, you run it for a few days and you make a prediction that emerges from that fluid dynamics and physics of the atmosphere and ocean about what the weather's going to do. In climate science you just, rather than doing a three or four day weather forecast, you run you might run your model for hundreds or even thousands of years, average out all that weather and what you're left with is the climate. And so this is what we, this is what Samuel did, well we did, we did it, I did it, but um, we imagine that this was Samuel um, Tarly doing this. And Maester Tarly, assisted by Gilly, 
found that the regional climates of Westeros pretty closely matched their descriptions in the books. A few things that we thought might be of interest were, 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 were some regions of the world of Game of Thrones, where in our Earth did they have a climate that was, you know, it was most similar to, if you like. And so, for example, we looked at the, war, the climate of the Wall, okay, so where the Night's Watch are. Where in the world is, has a climate like the Wall? Well, it, it turns out that it was, you know, parts of northern Finland and northern Sweden in the area of, commonly known as, as Lapland actually has a climate very similar. So if you live in those, in those areas, then you know what it's like to be a member of the Night's Watch. Similarly, we also looked at uh, Casterly Rock, which is the home of the sort of scheming Lannisters. And we found out that uh, Houston in Texas was actually had a very similar climate. Dawn had a very dry climate, a desert-like climate, you know, very, probably very similar to what the Sahara Desert is. Very limited water resources, as we, as we find in the book. So I think it's interesting. It appears that George R. R. Martin actually had a very good um, natural feeling for meteorology, if you like, because a lot of what he describes in the books actually ends up being quite similar to what um, is predicted by the model. However, there is an elephant in the room. What about the variable length of seasons in Game of Thrones? How would they work scientifically? There have you know, been many different predictions on or discussions online about how this might be done, whether it's you know, some sort of volcano going off and um, in certain seasons that cause the cooling of, you know, lots of different theories. But the one that we settled on, in some ways because it was the easiest for us to, to implement, is that we suggested that there's, um, the, in our, so in our Earth, the, the Earth is going around the sun and it's all, it always points in the same direction. It's axis, its axis of rotation always points in the same direction. So we have the North Star is the North Star, whether it's in summer or in winter, whereas what we suggested for the world of Game of Thrones is that that's actually changing throughout the, se throughout the seasons. And so as the world of Game of Thrones, as Westeros goes around the central sun, it's actually sort of tumbling on its axis. And so the Northern Hemisphere is always pointing, when it's Northern Hemisphere summer, the Northern Hemisphere is always pointing towards the sun. And when it's Northern Hemisphere winter, the Earth is always pointing away from the Sun all the way through the year as it goes around. Now, the Earth does actually do something similar to this, but on very long timescales. The progression of the Earth's axial tilt, known as axial precession, is one of several cycles in the Earth's orbit predicted by Serbian scientist Milutin Milankovic in the 1920s. These cycles are the cause of the Earth's ice ages, as they slightly vary the amount of sunlight the Earth receives. Dan proposed that Westeros underwent similar cycles, but on a much faster time timescale and varying more unpredictably. So we put that into we put that change into the model, if you like, compared to the real Earth, and saw what happened. And well interestingly for me, so this is so it turns out to be really interesting in that decades ago, so 30 or 40 years ago, it was a really common experiment that people used to do in climate models at the time, in sort of state of the art models at the time, people used to do what we call a perpetual January experiment in which they set up their model so it was always January. So little did they know, 30, 40 years ago, they were actually simulating the world of Game of Thrones then. And they used to run these, these simulations with their models at the time in a perpetual January. But in those days, that you didn't have an atmosphere and an ocean in climate models. They tend to be just an atmosphere and the sea surface temperatures and the ocean were just sort of prescribed by the user in effect. You'd, you'd say what those temperatures were and they wouldn't change. Well, they changed through the seasons, but year on year they wouldn't change. But with the model we used, it actually had an atmosphere and an ocean. And it turned out that when we put the world in perpetual January, the Northern Hemisphere got colder and colder and colder year on year, and the Southern Hemisphere got warmer and warmer and warmer until you ended up with basically a world with two extreme seasons. And it turned out that the winds became so strong because that change in temperature between two regions of the Earth, in this case the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, when that gets really large, it can generate very strong winds and instability in the model. And it turned out the model just crashed, it just what we call blew up, it glitched, if you like, and um, it couldn't continue. And so what we had to do, the only way we could resolve this was actually to reduce the angle of the axis of um, rotation of, of the Earth. So rather than being tilted at an angle of 23 degrees, we tilted it only about 10 or 15 degrees. And that was just enough to keep it, the model stable during this permanent, winds, permanent January um, type climate. So because Dan, or Samuel, sorry, 
was using a more advanced model that allowed for ocean feedback, a world locked in a perpetual northern hemisphere winter became unstable when it had an axial tilt the same size as the Earth's. The only way they could make it stable was by tilting it at less of an angle to the sun. And so this actually it was interesting in that I actually learned something about climate science from, from doing this that I didn't know before. Dan has previously done similar work looking at the climate of Middle Earth, writing as Radagast the Brown in English, with translations available again, this time in Elvish and Dwarvish. And this all may seem rather silly. At the end of the day, we're using expensive supercomputer time to calculate the weather on imaginary planets with wizards, dragons, and huge elephants. But to me, this work is an excellent example of creative climate science communication. Other people have linked climate to sport, to music, and a variety of visual art forms. Dan has used the common cultural framework of The Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones to allow for an easy, accessible alternative route into the fundamentals of climate science. One of the key messages that I was trying to get across is that the cl climate models that we use to make future projections aren't, are not tuned in some way. They're not statistical models that are tuned to our own Earth. They're based on fundamental fluid mechanics and physics, and so they can actually be applied to any Earth. They're that, gen they're that general, they're that fundamental, if you like, and I thought that this was an ideal way of getting that, getting that message across. So whether you're doing it through the medium of sport or people's interest in music, or whether it's um, science fantasy or, or fiction, I think anything you can do in the in those sorts of ways is a good way of, of communicating climate science. If you enjoy the idea of applying physics to fantasy worlds, then your next watch should definitely be the videos I've made on the scientific viability of planets in the MCU and Star Wars, links on the end screen. But if you found the idea of simulating worlds and computer code interesting, then it's actually super easy to do. With a little Python and some basic physics, you can easily simulate the changing temperature of a planet over time. Add a few more layers of complexity, and you have a climate model like Dan's. Now, I learned programming through years of trial and mostly error. But a better way to learn is through an expertly written structured course, which allows you to write code in interactive exercises and quizzes you as you go. Learning by doing with Brilliant. Brilliant is an educational website and accompanying app with a wide variety of expertly written courses, including several on computer science. Their Programming with Python course is an excellent introduction to the language, and with other courses available such as Algorithm Fundamentals and Machine Learning, you have a great springboard into writing your own computer code. If you'd like to get started in programming or any number of other courses in maths and physics, or gift access to the website as a present, head to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, and the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off their premium annual subscription. Thank you to Brilliant for their continued support of this channel. Thank you to Professor Luntz for being so generous with his time and also for being so patient. We recorded this about a year ago, before the current lockdown. Definitely check out his original paper, link in the description. And in particular, take a look at the section on how Westeros would be affected by a doubling of atmospheric CO2, which we didn't cover in this video just because of time. I'll give you a hint though, it doesn't end well for King's Landing. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and check out the videos I made on the scientific viability of the worlds depicted in Star Wars and the MCU. If you like this, you'll like them. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.